welcome to the Popcorn Talk Network. For the online broadcast network that features movie discussion, news, and interviews, press one. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. I'm opening. We have an eye, part of a nostril, two teeth. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Why, hello everybody, and welcome to Popcorn Talk Network's Anatomy of a Movie. Up oh, there goes the music. Ah, oh, there goes that magical, awesome Michael Giacchino score. Hello, everybody, and again, hi, movie fans. This is Dimitri Panos uh, here with my amazing hosts. I got Sarah Stretton on my immediate right. Say hello to everybody. Hello. I waved. <laughs> <laughs> Marissa, please say hello. Hello, everybody. And uh, d- doing our production, we got Alexis and Brittany new to the team. Hey, Brittany. Hello. What's Welcome. up? And today we are going to be dissecting, breaking down Tomorrowland. So uh, uh, let's get right into this because there's, I think there's a ton to talk about. So, but we're going to get right into this. Uh, Sarah, Marissa, did this movie knock you into tomorrow land? I can say that I really wanted to live in the commercial of tomorrow land. <laughs> um, for sure. I think that some of the technology they presented was a highlight of the film to me. I thought that the look of certain scenes was inspiring. My biggest question though was when I was leaving this, the theater there was, and I felt like such a kind of creeper, there was a little kid who was in the theater with me and he was leaving it right before. And I like try to eavesdrop on people, <laughs> but he wasn't talking. Like, cause I like, I eavesdrop on people as I leave the theater. And this little kid like wasn't saying anything and I wanted to be like, kid, did you get it? You didn't pick him up on the <laughs> capels yeah. and go, did you I, like the movie? I wanted to be like, do you understand what happened? Because that was like one of my questions where I felt like, and we'll get into story and plot in a minute, mm-hmm. but like once we got to the action, what was cause, the cause and like what was going on with the monitor, it was gone over really quickly. And this is a Disney movie that I think the all the themes and the morals are really aimed at kids or like adolescence uh, everyone because it is Disney and they include everyone but I want to know if the younger audience was getting it if mm-hmm. they liked it um, which I haven't been able to find out yet yeah I, I thought this movie visually was stunning the whole Tomorrowland I, again I wanted to live in that world my and I don't want to start this dissection with nitpicking or whatnot my only problem really was we didn't see enough of Tomorrowland God, and it's like I wanted to see more and we'll definitely delve more sure, into sure. it but there was so much of that world that we didn't spend enough time in mm-hmm. and I mean bring up other dystopian uh, post-apocalyptic worlds and futuristic mm-hmm. worlds films and like yeah I mean you have uh I mean, even Elysium, you know, that that was a futuristic type of world, but we spent a lot of time in that world. And, like, so all these other movies that we've spent worlds in, I just wanted to see a little bit more of it. That's, you know, that's a fascinating thing, and perhaps we, we can bring this up later on. There seems to be a, a, a schism uh, amongst people. Some people say it was way too much Tomorrowland. I've read some really? of the criticism has been, oh, you know, it's not based in whatever. I find those criticisms to be quite cynical. We can talk about that later. And there have been others. Even a good friend of mine said, "God, I, I wish there was more Tomorrowland mm-hmm. in Tomorrowland." So that's very uh, uh, that's it's it's interesting, and you've proven that 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 schism does actually exist. Yeah, I think there were maybe two, maybe three scenes, and those were fairly short scenes in Tomorrowland, and that was it. Hmm, interesting. Because I, I felt, uh, personally, I felt like the time spent in Tomorrowland, yes, it wasn't greatly expo- explored. I, I wanted to go into Space Mountain. I wanted, mm-hmm. I wanted to see somebody coming out <laughs> right. of that building or something. But again, we can talk about Tomorrowland itself. Personally, I love this movie. Um, 
great movie not necessarily but i can love a movie i can love a movie for what it is i loved what it represented and and i just love what its philosophies and what it represented it made me feel like a kid again i loved its celebrating imagination and imagineering and 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 smarts and and going and exploring and and just having the wherewithal to to have this great positive outlook um i love that for a for a summer tentpole movie this wasn't this, well this wasn't a sequel mm -hmm. um you know it was a, it was born of a seed so yes the cynics out there can say well it's based off of a disneyland theme park they're going to do this you are absolutely correct much like pirates of the caribbean was based off mm -hmm. of a ride but yet the seed of that story was original and it gave us something new and exciting and this from a science fiction aspect and, and point god i just love the, the wonderkind of it all and how positive and and to have we've talked about this a lot too to have two strong female characters in this movie and our lead character to be as intelligently precocious and to have this i want to know more and I can fix things. I know how things work, and to have that um, that sensibility is really lacking in a lot. And in in a in a day and age when we're knocking female roles, here's a strong female role that I thought the actress I thought she was fantastic. The look of this film I thought was beautiful. The score I thought was great. Um, you know, I just everything about this movie. The more I talked about it, the more. Um, the more I really like this film. Now, again, I am a huge Disney fan. So I, along with whatever knowledge I have of the Disney parks and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, that was there. I loved finding Easter eggs in this movie. We talked Easter eggs a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, Easter eggs are fun because for anybody, whether, you, whether we're watching this movie, whatever movie it is, like a Marvel movie, those people who can get the Easter eggs get a little... You know, they can get mm -hmm. a little more enjoyment. There are a ton of great fun stuff in this movie, and I know we'll talk about, but that led to my enjoyment, but it wasn't because, it wasn't the reason why I really enjoyed this movie. Okay. So, um, why don't we, well, why don't we talk about, well, why don't we talk about story? I think that's an important aspect, and we can go from story into acting, mm -hmm. um, because that actually, uh, you know, the acting, I think, really propelled this story very well. Uh, I really like the acting, so... Yeah, let's talk about story a little bit. Maybe a little bit of Inception. Any, uh, you know, because I, I know how this idea was was born, mm -hmm. which I think is great. So, I <clears throat> think that I think that I, for the first third of this movie, I was a little one. I was wondering which direction we were going to go because they really opened us up to three stories from the very beginning. You get the story of this video that they're taking in which I don't know I knew Robinson was the lead so I knew that they were together in making this video so you have that they have their own story together mm -hmm. Brit and um, George Clooney's character because you're getting that up close and personal what turns out to be a broadcast at the end but you get that from the beginning you don't know what that is then you get the very which in my opinion was very Wizard of Oz type introduction of George Clooney which was you set up a little bit of his character history you get the guiding light his like wizard or whatever you want to call it in athena you get the opening to the new world it just felt very wizard of me and then you stop that and you go to brit story so you really open with three distinct yeah. things mm -hmm. and you have supposedly what is the future supposedly what is the past and then what is the present it, which again i'm going to bring up your point because you, you you said something uh right off the top for a disney movie for any kind of a family movie to do something like that number one i felt was completely bold this i mean we are not going into a particularly linear type of storytelling mm -hmm. And we're going to be showing, we're going to do this little flashback thing. And I think for a family picture, this is a PG-rated movie. 
I thought that was extremely bold. And to your point earlier where you were talking about, hmm, I'm wondering if kids are going to do this and get this. And, you know, my only counter to that is when you watch any good Pixar movie, or you get, there are they, they, they throw a wide net and they make it a, a, a applicable to adults as well. And this is what I loved about this movie, where a kid could get into this movie and go, oh, my God, that's amazing, and maybe inspire them. But as they get older they'll look back and realize the lessons of their life and go, oh, mm -hmm. I understand that layer. Trust me, there's a movie coming out from Disney later on this summer, uh, that, that, that Pixar movie. <laughs> Talk about multi-layer. So, but, right. but this one, this movie has a lot of layers mm -hmm. when you when you go and talk about I it. I think that what I have to applaud this movie and its storytelling for is that I think that they shot for some very great ideals. Mm -hmm. Like, to put it out there, mm -hmm. but yes, they were bold. I'm not sure that it worked in entirely for me i because because constantly i was thinking oh that's a great idea i'm glad they tried i like this theme but it was more of me understanding that that's the thought behind it versus just being enveloped in it um there were times that yes there were things i admired about the making of this movie and i could understand why people would want to be on board however i didn't get fully entrapped I felt very much like an audience member instead of being part mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily, a, if that's a bad or a good thing. It was just for me a fact on this first time sure, watching it. Sure, yeah. Um Marissa, what did you think? My thing, as an audience member, because, Dimitri, you know more about the Tomorrow World and sure. the whole universe that, that Tomorrowland yeah, sure. is. My, you know a lot more than I, the average human being might of, I, of this particular universe. My thing, because I, I'm, I'm one of those regular human beings, I know the concept of it, but I don't know how it started, where it started, why it started. And I felt for the storytelling in this film, how they executed it, they rushed it mm -hmm. because it. I mean, we had the whole scene with the mannequin, and Frank is like kind of going over the four main people who started sure. it. But it felt so rushed. He's like, "This and this happened. These guys got together, and this is why." It's like because it was literally sandwiched in between an action, a chase action scene, into into another chase action scene, and I, I felt like okay, they're. They just inserted it just to tell the audience. There, there were a lot of moments. Just to, where you, it felt but, but just to clarify, you know, for those who are watching right now too, you're talking about the scene, and again, I thought was, you're, you're talking about the scene where they're in Paris, in Paris, in the, yes, Eiffel, in the Tower, Eiffel Tower, and they, and they come across the room that has um, H.G. Wells, I believe it was mm -hmm. Wells, Tesla, Vern, Tesla, and Edison. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so that scene right there. Uh, so now I love that scene because I do too. it. it the Eiffel Tower turns into a rocket ship, and, and these are some of the four founding. They were like some of the four founding members of Imagination. Some mm -hmm. of them put their imagination in print and made amazing science fiction tales. Others actually put it, put pen to paper and mind and practice, and they invented electricity. And they, and and I, I don't know. See, like I loved that those founding fathers. With their and then how electricity and yeah. technology, I I got that, but seeing it the first miss. time, I was like, okay, these four guys came together and formed a group. Sure. But doing the research for this film, I actually found out that they actually cut a dis a Pixar animated storytelling of the four founding fathers, mm -hmm. so to speak, that explained how Tomorrowland was conceptualized. Right. And um, Brad Bird, the director, he said that had they kept this scene in the film, it stopped the pacing of a dead right. cold. And I'm thinking that I'm because it, it, it's available on YouTube as of right now. Yeah. Um, there's a whole scene, like three and a half minute beautifully animated scene created by Pixar people um, that explain how it all started and you know the having electricity and technology and how like right. the industry boomed but also like positive things came from this industrial revolution but negative things also came their war and power and all, all the destruction along with sure. the good sure and but watching this animated scene made me understand Tomorrowland and why it didn't work right. out the first time as well as at watching this film. Right. And I think had they kept it, they could have put it at literally the beginning. You know how some films- Like a short. Yeah, 
was like some films start with a small sequence that this like this is what happened this is the world this is like laying it out mm-hmm. right. and um and it would have been a great starting so what did for you, the film i'm sorry i want to pinpoint what did you feel lost on in the film the the or? four main four main guys the, the edison tesla yeah Vernon, you just felt it was sort of kind of yeah it, it was rushed, through, rushed, like rushed through, dialogue yeah. and brad yeah. bird even mentioned uh he cut the scene because they felt they could just add the story to be explained sure, from frank sure. walker i was like you, i get that and one thing too i just want to you're very sweet in thinking that i know all like a lot of tomorrowland <laughs> I, I, i'll bring what i can but you know though i, I didn't it, it was interesting much like i didn't think of pirates of the caribbean as mm-hmm. an attraction ride tomorrowland is is a for those who have never been uh, why haven't you uh gone to either disney world in florida depending on which coast you're on or which part of the world uh disney world in florida or disneyland here in, in lovely sunny southern california or you know, disney to- has a park in paris, <clears throat> paris there. Yeah, and um, they have a tomorrowland and the uh, you know, it's it's a land and it's in one of the it's one of these spokes that goes off into Tomorrowland mm-hmm. and well before there was a a space mountain mm-hmm. and stuff it was to showcase Disney Disney did have a purchase for the future and he wanted it to be a positive a po- he believed it was going to be a positive thing and it was to showcase much like a World Fair it was going to showcase things like the Carousel of Progress which is no longer at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Uh, They shut that down. But the Carousel of Progress was a ride in which you went on, and they showed the new wave fancy schmancy electronics and gizmos. They're going to help your Mm -hmm. life easier in the future. So I didn't see tomorrow. Like, this Tomorrowland is not the parks. I really did find that there was a separation amongst, like, because I didn't think that, oh, this is the genesis of Tomorrowland, the the, Mm -hmm. world. I know that there was some history there, but this Tomorrowland was, I loved the Genesis and what it stood for and and the jetpacks. And, and again, I got to bring up jetpacks because this was one of the seeds of this movie. It was Damon Lindelof and, and Brad Bird having dinner. And they were thinking, well, what are, we, what are we talking about? Like a futuristic land or this Tomorrowland? And part of the thing was, well, where are the jetpacks? Where are the jetpacks? And I know when I was a kid, jetpacks were a big thing. And mm-hmm. growing up, maybe when I did, um, you know, I was I was I was raised. I was born around and raised during this great exploration of space. We were launching rockets, going to the moon, doing all this these great things. There was a vision of the future that included jetpacks. I mean, the Jetsons for crying out loud. And, and then I'm a big Star Trek fan, so. As a kid, like Damon Lindelof and, and Brad Bird, I always looked, God, the future is going to be amazing. And what are we going to do imagination-wise? How do we bring that through? And from that seed, that was one of their seeds of, of putting paper to pen and writing tomorrow in the story. And I love that because, mm-hmm. I, and I think from a kid's, you only get that from a kid's perspective now. I mean, a kid's perspective on, on, like is so not marred by cynicism mm-hmm. and or... You know, and and he can look at a cartoon or whatever, and like even a Transformers. I'm not saying like it's the best thing, but he can go, wow, there could be a world where these mm-hmm. things can change, and that's how I approached like growing up. And I had Steven Spielberg to help me along, but that's why you know, story wise, I felt for me the focus on kids is well, of course, they're almost a blank slate. Like they they still haven't been hit by harshness yet. And they still, there's that positive, like, feeling. And then when I left the theater, I felt that way again, you know. So from a story perspective, I thought that was amazing. Okay. I, th- so. I think it's just me personally. I'm yeah. a visual learner. And then I watch, watching this animated video explaining how Tomorrowland was created. Yeah. I, it just made me understand everything so much better. And he, Brad Bird, if he kept the scene, he could have put it at the very beginning. And it would then have been the great end, as a short. I think it'd be separate credits. from the movie as a yeah, completely yeah. separate short. Yes, I think that they had enough at the beginning. I think almost maybe too much. If they had added more at the beginning, they would have had to yeah. cut something. Um, because structurally, we can talk about what the movie they created. Yeah. Also, the four founders don't come in till 
what after an the hour halfway, and a half yeah, yeah. into the so film. to me they're not point. a found yes they're in the history of this story but they're not what the story is about right so i didn't need to see that um i liked that there was through lines like the world fair like they incorporated of course like it's a small world comes from the world fair in new york but it was moved to disneyland um the connection to the eiffel tower which in my opinion is one of the most famous iconic world fair monuments that was ever made like they did bring in a little bit of the history of there that it wasn't well liked like it was it was nice to me that they played with history and added like a sense of mythology to it yes and they blended those two um i didn't need more information because to me that wasn't what the story was about the story we were supposed to see in my opinion was how someone with imagination smarts youth and a positive outlook Mm -hmm. can influence all the people around her and it's very interesting because i think that oftentimes people do focus on the fact that one bad seed can spread and like they you need to eliminate that one um piece of negativity but it was nice to kind of focus on the one piece of positivity and see how that can spread. It agreed uh, so much, and and I love the 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 allegory that that Tim McGraw's as as um as as, <laughs> as her father, father as her dad. He plays a father. He's played a father mm-hmm. before, I think, in a movie. He does it he sort of kind of well. Yeah, he does a good job at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm a blindside. <laughs> yeah, it's not like I have a ton of. I don't have Tim McGraw records or anything like that. But as a dad, a I, I like him. <laughs> so, um, but the allegory that he mentions about the dark wolf and the light wolf mm-hmm. and which one lives and well, it's whichever one you feed. And that theme throughout the entire movie, it's like it, it really comes to light big time at the end of the movie in today's socially social media driven world uh you know all it takes is like you said all it takes is one bad seed to to farm out there and then things can go viral and i'm glad it was just nice to have something that there was Mm -hmm. positive my favorite scene in the movie or one of them i should say is in class Okay. There with the montage of her in oh. class, <laughs> right. raising her hand, and all of her teachers are ignoring her, and each teacher is talking about, well, they're, they're feeding on the negative, oh, the, the world is in bad shape, this, that, and her final teacher finally goes, yes, Ms. Newton, she goes, can we fix it? Mm-hmm. And, and it stumped the teacher, mm-hmm. and that, to me, is a great, well, can we fix it? And he had no answer, and then he was saved by the bell. But right. it's a really cool scene, and thematically, it really goes into that story. And it's also the message tonight, not just to add on, can we fix it? It's who in the world is brave enough and is motivated enough to be able to fix it? Mm-hmm. Who is actually going to yeah. put the effort into it? And have the imagination to, mm-hmm. to, to do so. And I'm not going to say, like, the, the movie clocks in at a little over two hours, mm-hmm. two hours, ten minutes. Two hours mm-hmm. and, like, nine right? minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um... For a Disney it, kids film, that is pretty it, It's long. a long movie. Yeah, it was a long movie. You know, when you add the trailers and, and all that stuff, it, it could be an investment with a family. Um, yeah, you know, and I won't say that it didn't meander a little bit here and there. I couldn't exactly tell you where to cut. Um, I, you know, uh, I, I, it was a two-hour and ten-minute movie. For me, it didn't necessarily feel that way. But it's, yeah, it's it's a little bit of an investment if you're going in. And for kids to sit down for two hours and ten minutes with so many things being thrown at them, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I understand the challenges. If we're going to go into favorite scenes, I yeah, it's not a full ahead. scene. It's just a moment. Which one? But my favorite moment in this film <laughs> is when you get to see um, Cassidy Newton... Um, interact when George Clooney's house is being taken over by the aliens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you get to see her go with a baseball bat at the robot and she just doesn't <laughs> stop. That was funny. To me, it was just so funny because we, I think that nine times out of ten, like you see them like hit it twice and they're like, okay, good. And they go off and you're like, no, it's gonna come back to life. <laughs> and at least this time she tried. She was oh, like, yeah. it is not coming back. Yeah. And that, it was like, it was just a but nice it's little a good moment. Yeah. moment. And it was a good moment for her because to me, one of the, the character choices that they did give her was that while she was a very positive person who was trying to fix things, she wasn't vulnerable. True. Um, mm-hmm. Like, 
yes, there's parts where she's like emotional vulnerability, yeah. but you also are seeing someone who might be breaking the law a smidge. She's a little who, bit street smartish. Who Absolutely. Can like is standing up with her family, has a relationship with her brother, like did very much like take control of the situation when she got to George Clooney's house, like proves herself to be a fighter Absolutely. as well, which I liked. I liked that it didn't turn into George Clooney completely taking care of her all the way, uh, guiding her step by step um, and just like showing that he has the experience. Like mm-hmm. there, we needed a reason to believe that she could change things and like sure. take action to change things. Sure. Um, and I think that they did give her that potential. Yeah, I think so as well. How did you feel about it? I really liked her character. Yeah. It's like she had spunk. And the thing about it, yes, she was somewhat rebellious and deviant, but it was for good reasons. Absolutely. And that's what I liked about it. I mean, you could be, you could break laws just for, you know, shits and giggles. But if you have an actual motivation behind it, if there's, you know, and justify the means, then all, yeah, all well, for her but, but let's be, I mean, straight up, there was consequence for her action. She, she got thrown in jail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, but it was, was also, consequence. Like, we as an audience understood. Mm-hmm. And I thought that they, I thought that they, they mapped that out well, because mm-hmm. I liked her reasoning. Again, mm-hmm. she's trying exactly. to save not only her dad's job, but she understands the ideals of this NASA building, this platform. This, this mm-hmm. platform. So, yeah, I agree yeah. with you 100%. They give a good reason for the audience to say, mm, she's not really a bad girl. Yeah, yeah. she's, <laughs> she's breaking reason. laws for the right yeah. reasons. And she's using uh, high-tech tech at the time. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you can get in trouble if maybe you make some really good tech. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as long as you didn't hurt anybody or kill anybody, it's okay, honey. But no, I, I really, I, I like that as well, and and I agree with you 100%. She didn't have to rely on George Clooney to get to where she mm-hmm. was. And I and again, George Clooney's character to me was a character whose inner child had sort of faded away. He had been, he had the harshness and the realities mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. cynicism of life really weigh heavy, heavily on him where his inner childhood, the spark sort of kind of went out. And by Cassidy coming in, he sees in her and then Athena, which brings up, you know, we'll talk about Athena because another character I love. Oh, she was awesome. You know, and then it just reignites that spark in that flame. And I loved it how, again, it was the kids who did this. Mm-hmm. And and George Clooney's character, again, has a great arc and how, you know, and we see him as a little kid and going to the World's Fair. And, uh, yeah, I, I really liked Clooney's character. I liked what he represented. Um, and, and Athena now, the girl who played Athena, and Athena as a character was great as well. Fantastic. I mean, really? I mean, yeah. She was great. Uh, it, it was hard not to... Um, it, it was... Hard not to hard, make her the, the main character. Yeah, and hard yeah. not to pay attention. Like, she was just so great and strong. Mm-hmm. And now, here's my question. Did you know that the Athena character from the get-go was probably an animatronic? Um, I mean, I think you get it pretty quickly that she's something different. Um, no, I did because I didn't. I didn't know they were going the animatronic route. That was Same something that was yeah. very much hidden to me in the marketing, which I think was a really good idea on Agreed. their part, Agreed. especially because it made the um, the memorabilia store scene so heightened because yeah. you didn't yeah. know that. Um, that being said, once it was revealed, I felt like it was very in the Disney vein, just because sure. Disneyland is famous for their animatronics. Like they're so to me, it was like such a a nice it's not an easter egg but a nice like nod to something they're good at it's just like something that we've seen them be good at and this is their perfection yeah. of it um so i didn't see it coming really liked it they set up that she was something different something special they set up that she had power in the very beginning mm-hmm. when you had her talking with um Hugh laurie's character so that i knew i didn't know what it was they right. hid it well for me and when it clicked when in. The reveal happened, I, li- like, I liked right. it. I wasn't yeah. like that was a cop out to me. It was like something they enhanced. Yeah. She's a great character. I would say that it must have been hard for them to really make her. She's supposed to be a, a secondary character. Sure. She's supposed to be a device, and she steals the scene a lot That's to where you are very say. curious about her own 
journey. And like she has a she device, developed. literally. Yeah, like literally, <laughs> she is a device. She is what brings um, Casey to this world. She is at the end. She becomes the bomb. Like she is a device, but yet. I think you have to give a lot of it to the acting oh, and to absolutely. the actor. She brought a curiosity for me as an audience member as to has this a gained emotions? Like what has happened? Is she not, like mm-hmm. I wanted to see this her whole story and she very much became a primary character lead was thought she was fantastic. Yeah, same here. And I, artificial I intelligence throughout the past, I don't know, about a year or so has become a major theme because mm-hmm. I felt this too. Here's an artificial intelligence where we mm-hmm. learn in essence that's what she is. She's she's free thinking, she's thoughtful, she cares about other people. Yeah, and it's and it's not just and, that. It was like at, at the was, beginning her character yeah, we see Hugh Glory is like interacting with her, yeah. treating her like a regular like a human child. being mm-hmm. uh-huh. and like and asking her is is this young Frank Walker at the mm-hmm. time good enough to be part of Tomorrowland? Like actual human mm-hmm. elements, and like she's wearing a dress, and very humanistic characters, and treating her like an equal and equal individual. Mm-hmm. That's what I loved about it, and the fact that there was the after the whole robot scene in the store yeah. there. And learning that she is animatronic, I was like, yes, more power to her because it's good animatronics versus bad animatronics. Right. Mm-hmm. I, it was the only one I just couldn't help but think of that great Jeff Goldblum quote from Jurassic Park. Yes, but John and Pirates of the Caribbean, the characters don't eat the, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. eat the things. And I was like, oh, wow, these are bad well, animatronics right here. These two. <laughs> they are killing AA the people. is just Disney's branded version of AI. Yeah. It's just <laughs> so, um, but yeah, in those scenes too, well, you, you talk about her dress. So let's, let's, we'll make that the first Easter egg. Her dress was modeled after Wendy's and Peter Pan. So she had the very windy and, and her hair yeah. and the curls and that yeah. bow. It was uh, and she was British. It was more structural. <laughs> was yeah. A little more structural, so, but definitely. Um, but. Okay. Yeah, and I loved her. So, what, what, what did you think about George Clooney? Uh, you know, I know I talked about him. What did you think about his character? I from, I mean, I liked his character from the trailers and promotions. I got a more positive. From the marketing aspect, I got a more positive light of his character. Like, he really liked the land of tomorrow. And he's like, do you want to go there? And, you know, asking all the clues to this world. And he's really enticing the audience, as a good promotional video should. Mm -hmm. But then seeing his character in the film, and now knowing that he was thrown out and literally exiled, and he scorned and jaded in that way, it threw me off. Because I thought he was the person like, yes, I love Tomorrowland. I want to go back, but I can't. But it was more like watching it. It's like, yeah, I was there, but I don't want to go back. Like, forget these people because they threw me out. Right. That and that as an audience member threw me out because I thought he was going to be a happy person mm-hmm. going into it, but he wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't think he would be as. Uh as dark as he was. Exactly. You know? yeah. I mean, he wanted no part of that girl and he, <laughs> that force feel thing at his door. <laughs> I was like, whoa. I go, geez, that, that, that seemed like it was a little hard. <laughs> but then it doubled back on him. So that, that, that was funny. He had it coming. Yeah, he had it coming. I think that this is like... Mm. So for George Clooney's character, like I, under- I understand it on paper. <clears throat> I understand that he was a very bright, brilliant little boy, kid, who then we he's jaded, and then by the end, he is inspired and wants to bring other um, intellectuals, creatives into this world. I get that. Unfortunately, I think it's being lumped in with me where certain of the, some of the character arcs, I feel like at the end, we got a very big... And now everything switched. Instead of, I don't know if it just wasn't that clear for me, but I felt like we know what's going to happen. We knew that how they were going to be transformed. And maybe it just happened a little too, their arcs just happened a little too cliche for me at the end. Um, Where it was very much like, and now we have the Athena George Clooney scene. And now we have the um, Casey making that final like move. Like it just, there was so much transformation in the last like five minutes. 
and then it was reaction to like the future and now they're one big happy family that a lot of that seemed a little crammed to me yeah a lot ha- a lot happened in the last 10 minutes of that movie yeah, a lot yeah. was going on a lot was going on Granted. and and also like i i i knew it was coming mm-hmm. i knew which arc that they had i and Part of me, I don't know if it, it, it needed to be drawn out more or I needed a little bit more doubt or maybe like some sort of hiccup of him falling back and being like, no, I've lost my hope again. But to me, it happened very, their arcs kind of happened very quickly. Last 10 minutes, everything's horrible. Let's all change. Now everything's perfect. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of like, you've, you've taken me on a very long two hour movie. And this is all happening very quickly, and I knew it was happening. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but then when I look at break them down to each individual characters, I do like their characters mm-hmm. because it wasn't <clears throat> a problem that I had with the actors or even the lives they'd created. It was just kind of, I guess, in a way, the pacing in which it was shown to me. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So when I look at like George Clooney's character, I liked George. I mean, he is. I, you don't really he's not really a teacher figure he's not really a father figure but he could be but he yeah. like <laughs> yeah like but are you gonna become that yeah he's an interesting dynamic and i think that the chemistry that he had with athena uh-huh. i think the chemistry that he had with casey i think that and also, just to mention it, the chemistry between Athena and Casey. I did feel like all of those were really yeah. strong. I enjoyed watching scenes with them. I didn't need all three of them to be together all the time. Mm-hmm. I was fine mm-hmm. when they had their own conversations. I was actually surprised, and, and again, I will say kudos for the casting. I was surprised at between the, the chemistry between Clooney and... And um, I'm forgetting the the actress's Ramsey. name. Ramsey. Ramsey. Wait, right? Rafi. Uh, Rafi. No, we're not. Uh, well, Rafi, but plays but Athena? um, no, the girl who plays Brit, Casey. Brit. Brit. I just combined. Brit, Brit. I, I combined Rafi and Casey. I and Casey felt to be Ramsey. that the chemistry Something. between Something. those two was really good. And and again, you're taking this girl Brit, who um, my only knowledge of her really is from like season one of Under the Dome, and that was like that's mm-hmm. after I stopped watching, but. She was great in that show, and I think it was, again, I think it was a very bold move putting a girl like her in a big tentpole movie like this because she doesn't, again, whatever her age is, Mm -hmm. she's not like this known, you know, Clooney is the name. Clooney is the name you're putting up in the marquee. Mm-hmm. And this this brick comes in. I mean, even in our there. logo behind us, it says George Clooney yeah. above the masthead. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Marlin. He's your name, and you're putting this the, the, this actress, pairing him, you know I mean? She spends most of her scenes a lot with him, even more so than her dad. And I thought their chemistry was great. It was very mentor-ish mm-hmm. as, as the movie progressed. And... That's what I loved it because I did see the subtlety in Clooney starting to warm up to God. I used to be this way, mm-hmm. and God, this is really good. And we got to go back to Tomorrowland because and another great scene was when she changed, when she changed fate, or when she quote unquote changed history from mm-hmm. when it went to a hundred percent destruction, and then it went to ninety nine point nine. It flashed up on the screen. It's like whoa! How how did you do that? She's like, what are you talking about? And that sparked, that reignited his spark and goes, you know what, kid? I was like, you are special. And then that journey begins for them. And I thought that that was great. And But again, their chemistry, I felt, worked. Mm-hmm. If you had found a lesser actress. Well, I, I was going to bring up the, supposedly the rumor is that before um, Brit got the role, there was an offer out there, or maybe talk, who knows, it's a rumor, so who knows what this is spawning off of, that <laughs> Shailene Woodley yes. could have played this mm. character. Which to me is very interesting, because if you look at the timeline, Shailene critically got a lot of attention after Descendants. Sure. So I'm sh- and George Clooney was approached with Torilam very much. He, I get the sense that he gets very invested in a project once he signed on. Absolutely. And so <clears throat> it makes sense why Shailene's name would get dropped. They'd been worked together before, and it and of course, Shailene ended up now doing the whole diversion thing. Sure. Um, but you could see parallels between that world, this world, how it all Absolutely. intersects. That being said, I think going with Brit was 
worked out really well for yeah, them. Yeah, I think so too. And and I love Shailene. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, she's great. She's a great actress, and she mm-hmm. would have brought she would have brought her chops, and it would have mm-hmm. been good to see them again. However, at this stage, she may have been a little bit like they they found, Brit was to me the perfect age to be where Shailene comes off as a little more mature. Also, like she, you know. I think that what you would have gotten, just supposing, is that, just, sh- just supposing, yeah, you're just I, imagining, <laughs> that Shailene, I think, in just from the power that she brings, is very similar to the power that Rathi brings. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. like, not identical, but you kind of get where I felt that Brit's imagination was very spontaneous, um, charismatic, right. you know, came in these waves of like idea. I I feel that the um, actresses like Rafi and like Shailene kind of carry a more calculated mm-hmm. approach, a uh, thought process. Yeah. It's just what I feel off of them. Yeah. I'm not saying they can't do anything else, but right. I think that if you put where I felt that Rafi and Brit very much had this chemistry because they're very different people that got yeah. along, mm-hmm. I think you would have seen much more ser- um, similarities if you had cast. Perhaps. And yeah. physically just, they look alike. Yeah. You yeah. would have gotten like, much and more. And then I think the mm-hmm. audience if you put two and two together, you could put them mm-hmm. as sisters, really. Yeah. And yeah. That, to an extent, and to I guess, have sure. a, Even a physical difference mm-hmm. helps tremendously. And it helps the chemistry of this movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so, too. And again, I, again, I just think that, like, like, I think Britt is growing up to be a really fine actress, as well as Shailene. But I don't think <clears throat> where, where, where Shailene can do a spectacular now, I don't think Britt... I don't know. Maybe she is there. I, I don't want to disparage the girl in case you're... I think she did a... I think Britt did a great job. And I think she was perfectly cast for this movie. And she was able to stand toe-to-toe with George Clooney. We already know that Shailene Woodley can bring that to the table. So, you know, and she's going on to make some... You know, between that and Fault of Our Stars, she's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I think now we have more... You know, Britt just adds to that stable. She adds to that wonderful stable of of young female actresses who are going to grow into these better roles, and I think this was an amazing for her, a great calling card. Mm-hmm. As um, uh, you know, as is Athena. I think mm-hmm. for a young actress, you know, she reminded me. You know, there there were glimpses of her that reminded me of a young Emma Watson because she was about the same age it seemed like mm-hmm. when Emma Watson first started in Harry Potter, and you mm-hmm. can sort of tell with Emma. That when she was in that first Harry Potter, that A, she was going to grow up to be beautiful, and she she was going to be this really good actress. And that girl, too, there, there are shades of, of Emma in her that I hope that we see more of her mm-hmm. in future I, movies. I, I definitely right. think so. You know? She is... She was fantastic. Speaking yeah. of another actor who I personally absolutely love, Hugh Laurie, yes, his character yeah. in this in this movie. Um, I think it was very clear to me that he was going to come back into play sure. from the very <laughs> beginning. Um, it was interesting. He has he has been after the whole house thing. I feel like he tends to sometimes play these a little bit darker sarcastic, sarcastic yeah. roles um i thought that he was a good opposition to uh-huh. george george clooney um i was a little confused about his theory on the world um what i understood from this movie is that the monitor was actually becoming it was supposed to be this ray of hope and it mm-hmm. was actually pushing negative energy. It was and, feeding off of a lot of energy yeah. mm-hmm. and then just pushing that back out. Yeah. It was more so was, a technological looping. Correct. And that <laughs> That's Hugh, a great way to put it. Really sure. well and that he, uh, Hugh Laurie's character, Nix, was... Great name. Yeah. <laughs> he His philosophy was that he had originally wanted to put this bad message out there to scare people into change. Right. And that... That didn't work. Well, they. Or, it's not that it didn't work. It's like people ate up the yeah. negativity so much that they tended to believe in it, and they and it didn't scare them into thinking. Geez, it didn't scare them into thinking. 
well, why can't we fix this? Mm-hmm. And we went into, well, it, the eventuality is it's going to happen, and this yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So his whole thing was, you know what, I'm going to reboot. I'm going to let this monitor do this, and then when everything goes to crap, start over. I'm going to just start over. Well, my yeah, thing with his kinda... character, because, I mean, Hugh Glory, he's a great actor. Yeah. My thing, watching him... I couldn't read him, and I don't know if it was because he was so stoic and serious. I couldn't tell what was going on in his mind, and I wasn't afraid of him in that way. And from a like, physical aspect, I didn't know if he, was, he himself was bringing the destruction on to the world. Like, right. I'm going to destroy every single one of you. No, it was more of the, the mental game. Like, okay, what's going on? What is his motivation to make the world think? Right that third ending in that way. Maybe right. it's because it went it was over... Hard, he was hard to read. Maybe because he went, they went over it so fast, but it just... They never described what Nyx was, like why he was chosen to go to Tomorrowland. And that was something that was really missing for me. Really? Oh, because I, I felt, you know, with, with him mentoring... Um, Frank, mm-hmm. because obviously he felt there was a great seed yeah. in Frank, and he was a well. But you even know, that, he we didn't like a, see a lot of mentoring, no, even we didn't in the see flashbacks. That history, but 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 you do get the fact that Nix is a pretty smart guy. Yeah, and you know? and yeah. I think that's what's missing though for me because mm-hmm. I didn't under if tomorrow to me what they established was that Tomorrowland is the place where the most creative, the most intelligent people go, and. I think that a foundation of those people is asking questions. Mm -hmm. And if your question is asked and it still ends up wrong, that's fine. But to me, I didn't understand why Nix's character tried this idea and wasn't asking more questions. To me, I understand that there was like the, well, someone has to be able to give up so we can see the brightness in someone going through. But it was missing to me because I I wasn't convinced. I was just like, why? I wanted something of like, I'm a scientist. I'm a what? I know how this works. I've been through these scenarios 50 times, and it's this is the my hypothesis is that this is the best case scenario. It felt so cut and dry that I didn't understand why he had the authority over everyone mm-hmm. and why people had elected him to be this governor. I didn't. I didn't understand what put him in that position of power. Like it bothered me that I felt like all these other people in Tomorrowland would be asking questions, would be trying to figure something out. I wanted to see those questions at least asked. They're shut down. That's fine. Well, I, think, but it, but I, you, I think you bring up a good point. I think that is the turning point in Tomorrowland because mm-hmm. there aren't enough um, there aren't enough Casey Newtons mm-hmm. in Tomorrowland anymore because Nix has been so he's become so jaded and you have to give the, the listen the guy created Athena so the guy knows how to the guy knows how to look into the future mm-hmm. um, albeit he can be a little harsh like w- w- when little Frank shows him his jetpack which by mm-hmm. the way is Easter egg for any of you Rocketeer fans out there that 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 jetpack is is almost a, a, an exact replica of the Rocketeer and when the kid flies the jetpack it's almost the same outcome as in the movie of the Rocketeer when they test fly the jetpack as he goes through cornfields and such. Like crash lands. Or, <laughs> crash which lands. also is a very nice visual parallel yeah. when we see George Clooney at the end crash into the fountain the same <laughs> yeah. the same <laughs> fall as his initial Still can't land there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, fly? Yes. Land? No. Um, anybody who knows where that quote comes from, <laughs> please dial in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that, that he became jaded. I mean, I, I, I believe that you know, I believe that he, he was a, I, I want to say that he was a judge uh, of this science fair at the World's Fair for mm. inventions. And, you know, this is a guy that had some, you know, that had some smarts. I can believe how people would have sort of followed him. Mm-hmm. I think that he just became, well, I'm trying to give the world, he almost became, he almost became a Bond villain to this, to the extent of, I'm trying to make the world a better place. No one's listening to me, so I'm just going to let it go to crap and I'm going to rebuild. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, the guy was smart enough to do it, but I think that he just hit his true natural agenda that this was going on. And it took this, 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 this smart, imagineering girl to say, hey, well, I, but we can fix this. And George Clooney and Frank's going, no, Nick's. 
she is what we used to be. She's what you used to be. Mm -hmm. She can change this. Mm -hmm. and, and that, she has the potential to change. She has the change. potential to change. And, um, yeah, to me, I, yeah, I, I got that Nick's... I'm just glad he didn't become a over-the-top villain. You know, he wasn't that. There wasn't no mani there wasn't a maniacal, no maniacal laugh. laugh and yeah. he didn't have the dastardly uh -huh. mustache. Like, they could have made him yeah. over the top and Hugh Laurie played him great. And I think that was also because I've... So, I mean, big Disney fan over here. But I yeah. think I've been so trained to believe every villain in a Disney film is that maniacal person trying to take over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think I kind of went into this film thinking, okay, this is why Tomorrowland went to crap because he was the one trying to destroy it. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, he started right. it, but he's the one that let it go to crap. So, and then I think that was just my approach to this. Like, okay, this is why Tomorrowland didn't work. But realizing, it's like, no, it was really everyone else kind of right. believing that it wasn't working. Right. Yeah. Should we get into some of the like the visual stuff? Because as we're talking about the scene, all I'm thinking yeah. about is one of my my I was like we're like I'm like we're I'm remembering all of the one of my favorite visual sequences, which I was surprised that it was actually one of my favorite visual sequences. Oh, what's that? As they play, as Britt got to play with the globe map. Oh, oh, oh. okay. Easter egg, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. the globe map is a uh, at least again i have not seen this this is not confirmed but for those of you who go to disneyland often if you go into disneyland and, and, and enter tomorrowland it, it, just before you get to space mountain and or pizza port um there is a big ball it looks like a big sort of kind of is marble texture oh. it's not this it's not the world and there's water underneath it it's and people can can, Play with can it. Mm, spin make, it. Spin the ball. And I was like, oh, that looks very much like that ball there. Now, I, in all the Easter egg things, I have not seen that as a confirmation, but I'm throwing it out there. I think it is. But that scene, yes. Yeah, but it was beautiful. Awesome. It, like, mm -hmm. one, on one hand, I was like, this looks like such a fun toy. <laughs> right? yeah. Like, this is the best Google Earth Don't I've seen yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, it was like, yes! It has Google Earth. I like it. Yeah. But it... It was a very different visual style than the rest of the movie. Yeah. It almost felt like they took like a planet Earth mm -hmm. take. Like we had, you had, <laughs> when you know when you get those soaring shots of planet Earth where they just like right. fly through and like <laughs> zoom in. I was like, oh. Or when it you are awesome. in like soaring over California yeah. in California Adventure. That's a fun And ride. you're like just going through. Yeah. Like I felt very much this movie is visually presented as like, a clear picture. You do get the flying scene in the beginning, yeah. but this scene, it totally switched and all of a sudden things were like coming at you. Yeah. Like the speed that they put in, like how they would get through and zoom in, it was like clear and direct. And, sp and then also at the end, they kind of put a kind of a similar motif to when they would flash in between the portal yeah, yeah, of the yeah, different yeah. scenes. But it was just a very, very different look and it felt like a different different film like it was the nature mm -hmm. the, it, but i thought it worked really yeah, I love well that scene too. I, mm -hmm. I i liked it i have a different scene but one thing about this particular scene when she's zooming in and she sees yeah. her own house being flooded right there's actually uh what i found interesting doing the research is that they used a miniature miniature model of that and they actually flooded it mm -hmm. and that that was a whole a mm -hmm. mini model of the house and they flooded that's it. That's a great which practical was great. Effect, yeah, yeah, great practical And that's going effect. back to After making all models. the visual effects and, graf yeah. and you know, uh, all the craziness that's going on in this, I I, I mm -hmm. thought it was awesome that they went back to basics for that yeah, one it shot. Was, yeah. Basics, it was totally different color scheme. Like, everything you went through, like, it was dark, it was smoggy, it was like these reds and oranges versus like, in the beginning, everything is I don't know about you, but with the first thing that came up, and then I was like, "Oh, and we are in a world of color." Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was so stark and beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I gotta ask you, like, what format did you did you get to view this movie? Like, regular, you, regular. Okay. Regular. So they they I, suggested um, the best way to watch is the Dolby. Yeah, I mean, which I because it was in four K, and um, I saw this at XD. I go to this Playa Vista because it's near where I live, and it's a beautiful theater, and mm -hmm. and. Again, to see this on a premium large format, whether it be IMAX or Dolby, I mean, God, it was beautiful. And yeah, it's just whenever 
I knew I was in for a different movie during the marketing. The scene where the scene in the trailer where she picks up that pin, okay, mm-hmm. which is another Easter egg I'll get into in a sec, but and it just automatically transports her into this other thing. I was like, okay, that's intelligent. Like I haven't seen that done before. I thought that was great. And those scenes I thought were fantastic. And like when she first walked into Tomorrowland, so mm-hmm. to speak, when mm-hmm. she took her tour. That was great. Oh my gosh. Let's my, talk about that. Because okay, that, that right. was my favorite scene. Okay, that's the like whole, a four minute scene. No, it was scene. six minutes. Yeah, and, six minutes yeah. consisted of seven to eight shots, all continuous, watching it. And it, the sad thing is, not a lot of people are talking about this particular scene. It was no. visually stunning. It was like visual diarrhea in, in front of everybody. I was like, holy crap. What? This is what my. I, like, I love the scene, first of all. I, I will preface it with that. My thing, problem with the scene was that there was so much going on, I couldn't enjoy it all because I was like, no, let's stay on this one shot, but the camera would literally zoom all over the place and I wanted to see more. It, and that's, as an audience, I was like, I want to stay in, un- in Tomorrowland. From, from a tech aspect, too, what's brilliant about that scene is that it wasn't shot seamlessly. It Ooh. was shot at all different locations and the way that it was edited, you're right. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Just beautifully done. And again, I'm going to throw out another Easter egg. And this is deep, deep, deep. This is a very deep Easter egg. And again, I have no confirmation that this is an actual Easter egg, but I'm saying it is. So, there. Um, Brad Bird, you can, if you're watching, you can chime in. Okay, so when she walks in to Tomorrowland, she, she sees three boys uh, jetpack racing, it seems like. Mm-hmm. And one of them crashes into a big bubble. All right, so he crashes, he rolls, goes up against the wall. The um, the bubble like collapses around him, disappears. One of his mates comes up and goes, "Hey, Dexter, come on, we're going to be late to class." Now, my instant, I just went back to again. This is going deep. Disney in the late '60s, early '70s, made three films with Kurt Russell. The computer who wore tennis shoes, strongest man in the world. Now you see him, now you don't. Mm -hmm. He was a, in that time zone, he was a nerd geek. His name was Dexter. Dexter Riley. I was Uh. hoping to hear a reference to Dean Higgins is going to be really mad. But I'm like going, this has to be. like if, Because how common is that name, Dexter? I mean, come on. So I was like, hey, Dexter, we're going to be late for class. And he was always running late for class. So... I don't know if it's it's not confirmed, <laughs> but I'm throwing it out there that that is a deep Disney Easter egg. And watch those movies, by the way, because that's a very young Kurt Russell, and those movies are goofy family fun. I, I, I did not catch that reference, but I will say that the, my two favorite things about these scenes were, one, couldn't help but love the text, loved the inflatable... Um, <laughs> suit. Airbag suit. Sure. Loved the pools. The pools are great. That was pools amazing. Through space. I um, wanted to swim in those. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, on top of that, how they dealt with the um, the fact that this was a commercial, so she kept running into things, falling mm-hmm. downstairs. <laughs> um, when that she was when she does fall and like hits the cornfield like fifty yes. times in real life, how she ends up in the swamp. I thought that that was so fun because as I was enjoying the scene in the back of my head, I was like, oh no. Oh no! <laughs> what what, is, she, what, what, what is she going to do? So how they dealt with that whole aspect of it, I thought was a layer that was really, really fun. For yeah, me. and so complex to mm-hmm. do when you figure it out. Because again, I think Brad Bird storytelling and direction educates the audience as to okay, I'm going to show you a flash of this when she picks up the pin. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You know, but then they they just they give you a little they feed you a little bit more and more mm-hmm. and say so that you understand the concept. And I just found it funny that she goes into this wide open field and she still runs into a swamp. Mm-hmm. You know, but it was just it was just it was very well done and it was original. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was, it was original. awesome. And uh, technically, how they did that because they're in a wheat field when she yeah. technically first starts out, but they they built a, a middle of the field uh, somewhat of a small road and they had uh, an extended pole with a seat on it so it, you know, she would sit on it and make it look like she was floating right. and that's what I thought was brilliant I loved how they matched up sure. from the 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 we because technically that it's not easy to mm-hmm. do and so you go from we feel to you know uh, 
Vancouver. Vancouver and to Spain. Spain to, you, exactly. And you would never know. And Man, movie magic. It really, and again, another reason why I feel this movie should be celebrated more is for its movie magic. Mm -hmm. And it has shown us something that we have as an audience. I can't recall when I've ever seen sequences like this before. And for a summer movie, to, to show me something like that. And I don't care that it's based off of something that's inside the Disney park because they didn't make it an attraction. They made it They made it a good spectacle, movie magic. That doesn't bother me either. I, I don't mind the inspiration. I don't mind anything like that. I think that if I was trying to pinpoint the things that are hard to get past in this movie yeah. or what it is critical about is there's a very strange idea of who they're speaking to. Mm -hmm. Where at one hand, there's very very they come straight out with their themes right. you don't have to search hard to find what they're trying to tell you mm -hmm. they are very obvious about the wolves pair like right. they are very obvious about optimism about inventiveness about creativity about supportive family about caring about being inspired these are very put there is no hiding them no. they're right in your face but at the same time they hide a lot of the plot story what's going on behind this behind the scenes and i thought that it was just like unclear because as an adult i didn't need as much of the themes put in my face but i right. needed more answers but then i was like but as a kid who would go see him yeah they would take away those things but would they be getting all the rest to understand it so to me that was the hard tug and pull sure where i was like mm, who are they really sh getting this to who they want to get with? Like, if it's if this movie is made to inspire a couple kids to make great tech, then yeah, it did that. It's it did it send its message loud and clear. It's just like sometimes I was like, well, I don't need to hear them that clearly. I want to know more about what's going on behind, like why. Mm -hmm. this is but all again, I always find that to be a cornerstone of a really good Disney movie, whether it's mm -hmm. an animated movie, whether it's a Pixar movie, and like mm -hmm. I said. You know, there's this movie coming out called Inside Out. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, the Excited. layers in this movie are, are insane, and and you may have the same questions. But again, I find that's what's that is appealing in that movie. But that's what's greatly appealing to Tomorrowland because, as a kid, <clears throat> like if I were an eight year old kid, I, all that stuff would mm -hmm. be right over my head. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, right over my head, and I'd be I don't care. It's like a lot of like it's like the first time. Let me put it this way, and don't crucify me for making... I'm not saying this movie's better than. I'm just making a comparison. The very first time I saw Star Wars in a theater, I didn't get thematically what it was all about this hero's journey and the mythology of that and, and knights uh, and mm -hmm. the things. Even the same way I looked at Star Trek as a kid... Mm -hmm. To Star Trek as an adult, it has completely changed for me. But I'm glad that I still keep the inner kid so I can enjoy the action adventure, much like you can with Star Wars. And I'm not comparing that Tomorrowland is today's Star Wars, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying thematically, yes, as a kid who watches it at eight, this movie will be a different experience when he watches it or she watches it at 16, 17. And then maybe again, if they so choose to watch it with their kids, it could be a different movie. That's one of the that's a that's a great aspect that that a good science fiction movie mm -hmm. can have, and 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 again I got to go back to I love the fact that they are female characters. They're not. She has every right to be like she is not a princess per se, but man, she sure is strong and she's smart, and right. I love that. I did want to see her invent something. I will yeah, throw right. that out okay. there where yeah. I was Fair like. Enough. I was like, I... She invented the seed of hope. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for someone who was so tech savvy and like being able to, I wanted to see her make a device of some sort because I do think that that would have been an that, interesting okay. perspective because um, I want, I wanted to see yeah, her make sure. something. To both of those points, it was, I think, uh, Athena's character was more the controlling of what has already been uh, created mm -hmm. that was somewhat destroying right. the world. So it was more so let's let's bat down these fires mm -hmm. because she's the only one that can control it. Sure. And then also going off your point, the females. It's not just females; they're young females. Oh, absolutely! And that speaks in volumes. I think having so two too. young characters I think as so your too. lead, as your lead characters, that just shows a whole different world mm -hmm. and like how well 
the world has progressed. Yeah, and let's face it, Disney throughout their history too, whether it be uh, was her name Haley Mills from the original Parent Trap yeah. to Jodie Foster, they have been able throughout their their. The, the, their their history, their film history with kids movies, they they have been able to create live action and pick strong actors, actresses for these roles, mm-hmm. and they continue to do so in this movie. Um, we already talked about, we were talking about ex- effects. Now, I read this, and this sort of kind of, uh, this was a little bit shocking to me. There's a lot of special effects happening on screen, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they, they, yeah. I'm only 1,037 effect shots with the staff of close to 200. Now, the staff, again, I thought there were way more than 1,037 shots. I mean, to I me. I would have thought so. Oh. Wait, right? I mean, maybe they did a great job. Um, Where did they find that platform? I don't... Like, yeah, I, even, they built, like I, mean, I was like yeah. going through the scenes, I'm like, well, you have to assume that almost all, <clears> except for when they're like inside the building, all the outside Tomorrowland shots. Actors uh, in oh. Vancouver, they built uh, most of the effects done for Tomorrowland were almost completely computer generated. Though some were done with stationary pieces that the actors stood on during shooting in Vancouver, Valencia, Spain. Mm-hmm. And I so, think most of those shots were all in the six-minute sequence. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, but like visually, it was stunning. Stunning. And the scene, as great as that six-minute sequence was, that was only six minutes, and. It, and it, there was a point in the movie when, because we see them, they're in the truck forever, mm-hmm. talking, their whole dialogue, traveling and whatnot. I I was very aware of how long this movie was, and it was an hour and a half into the film. Mm-hmm. I literally thought to myself, they're still not at Tomorrowland. Yeah. We see all this traveling, but they're still not there. Yeah. And again, I can't keep, I, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but I wanted to. You the audience to, to get to tomorrow. Sure. Okay, I get you. No, I, it, it makes from that standpoint, you make. Yeah, I think you make good sense. Uh, it didn't necessarily bother me all that much um, because, to me, even though it was about Tomorrowland, it was about the tearing down and then the rebuilding and how are we mm-hmm. going to get that thematically. You know, we didn't talk about the we didn't talk about the comic book store. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. know, the comic book store scene. Number one, just label it as an Easter egg. Just label (laughs) the Easter egg store. But you had two great, you had you had two great actors, Mm -hmm. uh, who were the comic book shop owners, Michael Key and Catherine Hahn. They they were they were fantastic. Uh, I was, you know, my my one. My one caveat is I actually thought that they were going to be part of the positive part of the journey. <clears throat> so it doesn't happen that way, um, which is fine um, because maybe it would have been too much. But that whole entire scene outside of, you know, Brad Bird's Iron Giant, the Incredibles, it was. The whole scene's an Easter egg from, okay. from Star mm-hmm. Wars to Star Trek to Forbidden Planet to Lost in Space. To all of these things I saw and I knew as a kid, the Star Wars number one comic from Marvel when Star Wars came out, the Star Trek landing party model set that included the communicator phaser and and tricorder. All the stuff was awesome. All, this is what I felt like. I was just like, <laughs> first of all, this is the Easter egg store. And I was like, and this just shows that Disney owns the world because you don't really feel like you're missing too much. Now like, they do. They get to license, they have the licensing rights over like everything you heard it they can do a whole field store without you being like this is a disney store well, mm-hmm. i had read somewhere about that 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 star trek was actually supposed to be a little bit more prominent but since now disney owns lucas films well of course they're gonna push a little bit Throw more star wars, wars some Pixar, and we had the new star and... wars coming out so <laughs> it was just, it was, just it was drive funny. more traffic yeah which the trailer was in front of my no. when i saw Tomorrowland. yeah no, i like I, I like the scene i love the characters because yeah, i thought so they were going to be funny we know yeah. these two actors they're comedians they're mm-hmm. funny and I, I've seen so many films with Catherine Hahn that like I've been ingrained that whatever her character is it's gonna be kooky or crazy in right. some way uh-huh. so I was expecting something crazy coming out of this scene and sure enough there was a whole and showdown and it delivered and it yeah, was great it was a whole was showdown fun. it was fun and yeah. hand it to Rafi for training for Sitting two months day, and yeah. doing yeah. like half round stunts from doing like Martial gymnastics arts. all of that it was great Yeah, it was great It was. it's a really good scene and yet it, it's just another really good scene set among some other really great scenes and they weren't just cobbled together like to throw Oh, 
we just want to do a good scene like through the narrative it kept you going and interested so and now I, I did talk about we talked about the pin okay now the pin is a, it, again I look at the pin as another Easter egg again for you Disneyites out there who go to Disneyland and or Disney World wherever you are you would know <clears throat> that pin the, the like the pin buying and collecting and trading is a, a major huge. subculture especially here at Disneyland a huge subculture so much in fact so that I had my Tomorrowland pin when the trailer first hit the screen I remember and I and I watched the trailer for the first time my first thought wasn't necessarily this looks great this looks I can't wait to get my hands on that pen. <laughs> I want that pen. So I just found uh, that that uh, I just found that that using the pen, yes, you can say you can be very cynical, and and I couldn't I couldn't argue against you saying this is just another ploy for Disney to get you to buy stuff when you're there. But as of last check at Disney, um, these pens have been sold out for a month. I'm sure they'll be getting more in, but I can't wait to take this on to It's a Small World, and uh, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can be transported. <laughs> Into um, a different uh, Yeah, because I thought that that was, again, very clever, very imaginative. Very um, Disney. When, very Disney. You know, starting <clears throat> off the Tomorrowland in on a Disney ride, right. I was like, okay, you're driving yep. traffic to your actual location. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to, and I, and I, I want to talk a little bit too about the music. Michael Jean Kino is no, no stranger to Disney movies and mm -hmm. scoring some mm -hmm. Pixar, some great Pixar movies, including The Incredibles, who we worked mm -hmm. with Brad Bird. Brad Bird. I felt that the score, I, I have it, I have listened to it now a good dozen or so times. I found the score to mm -hmm. be not only pulsating and moving this story on its own, it is imaginative, and it really, you get that sense of imaginary mm -hmm. and heroism, it's, it's great. And if you want, you can just look up the names of all of the things he's named, the tracks, oh, which yeah, are just awesome. very clever, tongue-in-cheek, funny. Peaking uh, your Pinterest yes. is one of my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could tell that that, that well, just reading the names and listening to it, you, you can get the vibe that he was yeah. going for. I'll give it to him right off the bat. I was like, huh, are they gonna use original score or is this taken from the parks? Like, it fits so much in the Disney yeah. vein that I was like, I wonder how what themes they are drawing from because it, it just fit really yeah, it, well. Yeah, it, it, it was it's wonderful. And, and again, I can I can vouch, I can tell you that to listen to the soundtrack on its own with no visuals, it really is great. Now you say, do they use anything from the park? And they did mm -hmm. uh, in Tomorrowland at, at the fair when he walks into the world of tomorrow. Uh, again, Carousel of Progress. You were mm -hmm. greeted by the the robot voiced by Nathan Lane, who is called Tom Morrow. And he sang that song, Welcome to Tomorrow. Uh, so and I was Nathan like, Lane has also done that. Disney voices. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, let me ask, uh, hey, you find folks in the booth. Have there been any live comments, questions uh, that, that, that you've noted? Um, let's see here. We haven't really had too many questions, but sounds like everyone's kind of not leaning toward um, Shailene being in there. Fair enough. Someone commented that they really liked Athena, but the Greek goddess of wisdom. Uh, yeah, I thought that name, well, it's very interesting because like also not only is Athena the Greek goddess of wisdom, but she is very famous for wearing a suit of armor, right. uh, yeah. being prepared. Yes, it is wisdom, but she is a strong fighter. No, she is not the wisdom that sits back and dictates. She is right. very much an active, um, part of mythology rides into battle is the daughter of Zeus out of his leg like um, if I'm yeah, not mistaken well, she I could be wrong I don't know if that. it came from his leg but yes, yeah. Athena and Zeus um, yeah and, and, Greek, I should know because I am Greek and Greek mythology <laughs> but let's talk about her for a second let's talk about her costume designer um, not her dress um, so to speak but her actual Tomorrowland costume I thought this was very interesting uh, Athena typical um, created a dress but under closer inspection each die matched her eyes with an overlay of a pattern based on the golden ratio made out of all logarithms and theorems, numbers and letters, which keeps repeating so the lines are not straight. If you notice this, and I'm like, mm, wow, detail. that is Detailed. going into crazy, crazy 
detail so much well detail. over my head and thank you for that comment um who, who can we give credit to the person who uh talked about athena as the goddess of wisdom yeah um, while we're doing that, and whilst you find that name, I think that, to me, the most Disney-esque shot of the entire film, yeah. I think, is the end. Okay. When <laughs> you do get everyone in the cornfield, all <laughs> different <laughs> ages, all simultaneously at the same time, popping up. I was just like, Disney just... It has to have their bow. They have like. to have their bow. Well, how about the opening of the movie? How about the open? Like, like you know, it's always you know, we, for a Disney picture, you're usually up on Cinderella's castle. But the reimagining of this tomorrow, uh, the Cinderella's castle within Tomorrowland, mm -hmm. I thought that that was great too. And that that and plays a part, and that's very much on purpose. That wasn't Absolutely. a coincidence. Like they sure. designed Tomorrowland to have the the look and the structures that Cinderella's castle does have. They do that in general. I think oh, we, we just saw them do that in, of course, Cinderella itself. Right. But yeah. they, I like the loyalty I feel like they yeah. do have to her castle. Absolutely. It makes it, obviously, in the opening and how they transform it to fit their different Absolutely. movies. Um, how they keep making an original mm -hmm. yeah. after yeah. We've, we've seen it so yeah. many years. Yes. I liked so. the fact, starting off the film, that... Um, we had the two main characters talking directly to the audience. To the audience, me so too. That, that sort of threw me I, off. It threw me yeah, off. Yeah, and so, you I mean, you're immediately breaking the fourth wall. Absolutely. So, for a Disney film... Tomas Zelenka, still, I'm sorry to interrupt, but he yeah. had the... Uh, so, so Tomas, thank you thank for you, watching. That's, that, that's great. Um, so, yeah, so for a beginning... I did like that creative choice to break the fourth wall. I agree. To, to speak to everyone. And it was funny because, again, I, I think it really proves the chemistry that those two actors had because that was a rapport. That yeah. was like a committed, hey, like, no, that's that's not the beginning. But And I like how she took the camera. It, it I'll funny. give it to them that it felt like Disneyland. Yeah. And to yeah. the address that right. you get as they yeah. stand normally on and the bridge in front of his yeah. in front of the castle uh -huh. and they start talking to and like you do Beginning get every ride. When, yeah, or when you get the archive footage of Walt going yeah. through doing the instruction and of yeah. course it's normally Mickey Mouse who like comes up or something that and is interruptive. Um, I felt a little bit of nostalgia there. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. you know, if yeah, I, I felt a lot of that. I don't think you necessarily need to be the Disney file to really enjoy this movie um i don't know we can start wrapping things up but listen uh, what, um, what, go ahead actually one, Wait, one more thing yeah no absolutely um, again me wanting to see more of tomorrowland yeah there is an actually great website called take me to tomorrowland.com where if you go to that <clears throat> website you get literally a visual tour of tomorrowland high res visual tour so you can stand on the platform and learn more about this element and this platform these suits and there's even a a um feature where there's the the whole hall of you know, timeline of tomorrow mm -hmm. and i was learning so much more about tomorrowland yeah. than i did in the movie yeah and that's what i really found interesting there uh the, i believe is called hall of plus ultra and uh -huh. you learn a little bit more about the four guys who started it and you know, even timeline started from 1889 right. was the conception mm -hmm. and then 1908 they launched it and then there was a whole setback and then they started again and just literally learning more about it shut that what's that website again it, it is called take me to tomorrowland take me to so tomorrowland. if the movie did not have enough tomorrowland yes. like marissa you can go there and, and there's find a game it on it too Ooh, i was pl just I go to found myself <laughs> playing the game on the website for a good 10 minutes i was like i should That's be great. researching but I'm caught in Tomorrowland. Great. Such a cool website. That's great. High res. Look all around the is, place. Is there anything that, that we didn't talk about? I'm that? sure there is, but because yeah. it is a two hour movie, yeah. which has hours and hours that they yeah. put into it. Sure. I think that visually got across themes, they got it across. There is, I do have one question because this about is about the reception hit me. I'm sorry. of the film. Yeah, we could talk about the reception. Oh. Um, but just Box before office, we go into reception, yeah, we, and we should talk about the reception of the film. But did, did this feel, let me ask you, did you feel that it was a very liberal PG rating? <clears throat> yes, because there, there were a lot of moments where we saw Frank Walker say hell over and over and over again. And I was very aware, like, kids are watching this, and he's like, ah, hell. And, and I mean, you get, you're uh -huh. caught up in the action, but there was a good amount of language in this film. There's also a good amount of violence. That's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. There's a, sort of uh, kinda... Especially when you're talking about 
we have, for instance, before they reveal the AAs, mm -hmm. like yeah, you have a same, head yeah. get ripped off. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Then it's revealed that it is a, a r robot, but you know, then you do have tons of AAs get destroyed um, in a very violent manner. Uh, I it's hard to say because I think that kids ratings just as adults are getting more conditioned to violence like so are kids and it's hard to say when like you know the cartoons have just as much violence when you're watching absolutely all of the superheroes sure, and whatnot and I think it must be getting harder and harder to rate things because I'm sure there are parents out there who are like, no, I want to stick to the tra traditional parameters of there should be absolutely no nothing in the context of even being considered swearing. Um, Biden should be kept more off camera, whatnot, um, versus adapting to the much more violent heavy graphic nature of the products putting being put forth yeah it was for me I, it was interesting and, and and i look i i know folks at the mpaa and uh, the, the rating system is a little bit flawed coming from <laughs> from working at an independent studio they do their best they do um i will throw that out there i was a little bit surprised um and again i don't want to come off as like uh the old the old fogey or whatever but th th there was a scene when somebody got hit by a car mm -hmm. that sort of kind of like happened out of nowhere mm -hmm. and i was like holy crap and that i was happened. like going wow th this is a pg movie like you know if it was pg-13 that would have been wow so to me it almost seemed that that was a a little bit liberal on the PG as opposed to right. PG-13 on this. And also, I can't um, imagine this film being rated PG-13 where in reality kids can actually ride and go to Tomorrowland physically. Yeah. And you can't... But they're not and, getting and then to have the Yeah. But no, <laughs> yeah. but to... But yeah. If this film was PG-13, the irony in that, that yeah. kids no, can't I, watch this, but they can go to the actual land Kids would have gone to it regardless, but it just seemed... It was it was interesting. It was something that, you know, not that it bothered me. Like, oh, I wouldn't be a parent that would have been... Yeah, I wouldn't have been a parent that would have been, oh, my God, this movie was too much for my, you know, for my mm -hmm. kid. Uh, I still think it falls in that realm. It, it just makes me wonder if there were things that they had to shave off. If, like, it was difficult mm -hmm. <clears throat> to get to that PG, so I had to throw that out there. And No, I agree. I think it's, it's uh, worth noting. So, mm -hmm. and, and let's talk about the reception of this movie, because to me, I was actually very surprised at a couple of things. Um, most Mostly, I think I was mostly surprised at the Rotten Tomatoes a score of 49 which is now at 49 percent i was reading a lot of the reviews for and the audience yeah, yeah, well no just just rotten tomatoes just the reviews uh, you know cinema score gave it a b so i i don't know again when they're pulling those tabs i'm not sure what the audiences were were quite expecting and maybe i just have a pollyanna-ish view of this movie um i'll admit that but I, I was just a little bit taken aback by, you know, not that 49 or 50 percent is god awful, mm -hmm. but with them after seeing this movie, and I, I sort of kind of went in knowing, just seeing Rotten Tomatoes, that it may not be that I, I, I should sort of kind of god, prepare yourself, prepare myself for it because I was really looking forward to this. Brad Bird, in my mind, has not made a bad movie. Um, I really enjoy seeing this stuff. I enjoy seeing George Clooney. It, it th you know it seemed like a movie that would have mm. been in my warehouse and I was going to be disappointed if I walked away thinking this wasn't a good movie and when I came out I was like what the hell did I see so differently from a lot of these reviewers mm -hmm. um, and then I read the reviews and there were there was a lot of cynicism and there was a lot of that well Disney synergy in there they just you know they're they're just stamping out more, more things to you, make you spend money uh, do you stuff. think it's the the theme of world destruction because of the environment <clears throat> well but see i don't know because i didn't catch this as a global warming kind of a movie i got a taste of it i, I, yeah, I got a little bit saying, of it. but i didn't see it as global i i global warming was such a small i got it as more of a philosophy in today's world of what what if you f which which lion is going to live and it's the one that you feed so it's negativity this global warming or whatever it is because they didn't quite say it was global warming I, I, from what i recall i just think there's a that lot of different world was. disasters absolutely i mean talking about reception i i talked about this the other week on box office we were, we were talking about what we thought it was going to make and the fact that this is a Disney movie with George Clooney, a lot of people could 
predict that it was going to make a lot more. But mm -hmm. just looking at the energy that this movie came out with, it wasn't in the normal Disney positivity. It was very much the mixed reviews were at the forefront. There wasn't... Uh, it didn't seem like there was a lot of excitement around its release. Um, even, I would say, coming from the company, like, as just an everyday person who watches ads and sees the marketing, I was wary of this film. That was the what was really striking me. Also, talking about, there are, this is a big budget movie, and there are a lot of big budget movies coming out this summer yeah. that have already started coming out. I think people are when it comes to dealing with things that are futuristic, that are in space, that are whatnot, that are larger than life, they're being more, a little picky about what they want to go see, especially when tickets are getting more expensive. You want sure. something, like we've talked about it, people want guarantees. They want something that they've been told to see, that they're excited to see, and I don't feel that Tomorrowland had that buzz. Yeah, but you can't, again, and that's like, I think what you bring up is a major problem because you can't go into an out, into a movie with a guarantee. Mm -hmm. We all have various opinions. I mean, I've gone to movies that people have said have been great, and I've walked out there saying that was mm -hmm. the worst piece of garbage I've seen. And and, you know, conversely, I've seen movies that I've really liked, that I've talked to people, and people go, what the hell were you thinking? What did you see? So to me, there but, are no guarantees on that. I just felt like, I don't know. The, I felt Disney, and I was at Disneyland mm -hmm. when they had the premiere of this. And they had the premiere of this a good two and a half to three weeks out, mm -hmm. which is rare. Most movie premieres are held about a week or so out of their initial a week maybe a little bit more because that gives a lot that that gives press time mm -hmm. when you're doing it two to three weeks before that means the studio is really believing in this movie and they're not going to mind early press yeah. like they're going to get early press out of this so i was like well geez if they're they're premiering it so early like that's a good sign for me because that means they're going to have long lead press talking about this movie. And then when I saw 50%, I was a little bit shocked. Okay, but this is what I'm also going to throw out there. Like, I'm not saying I disagree with you because I, I do really enjoy seeing movies when they come out. But I think that there is a trend, um, not only to want the guarantee, but also that movies are being designated more as... Like, you get people saying, I'm going to wait for that to come to Netflix. Because they mm -hmm. know they don't have to wait that long. This isn't when we're talking about Blockbuster Home Video and you're like, oh, this isn't coming out in six months. This is, oh, some movies are getting automatic on-demand releases. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, this is a Disney film and Disney kind of holds their yeah, things but I, I, I can go yeah. into a whole philosophy about VOD and that it means nothing. And, and like, literally, because there are so many... I'm not going to get into my VOD soapbox right now, but literally VOD means like nothing when it comes to it, because if it did, the actors who are involved with it, if it really meant any impact on their careers, they wouldn't be doing so many VOD, but they're getting some good coin in doing it. And mm -hmm. go ahead, talk to me about a VOD movie that was fantastic. So, but going it's into perfect. this <laughs> no VOD movie. Nah, but it made money more, not VOD, but like made its money and its but mark I think after it's the, the our generation yeah, that, now who's watching it's home entertainment yeah. our video our generation now who's watching film they're so trained now to expect instant gratification no i, I and, and that's what the world is working it's become very to. very fragmented but to mm -hmm. not see a movie like tomorrowland we talked about it a lot during mm -hmm. mad max uh even in avengers to 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 to, to dismiss a movie like because this movie looked gorgeous. You are not. I, I don't care unless unless you are a studio head or you know, and you have a unless mm -hmm. you're Steven Spielberg and you have a movie theater as your screening room. You're not going to get this experience to watch Tomorrowland. Like I'll see Tomorrowland one more time. I in fact just today it, it was available on pre-order on Amazon. So I've pre-ordered it. I'll watch it on my TV, right. but as a secondary. Um, to see this with the audience was great. I, you know, I, I just felt that it was a slow week of box office. Now, its budget was $190 million, um, so, and it's including its hard drives and advertising, 225 So, you know, currently... Has it made its money back? 
Or well, do you think for, it will make it? Yes, yeah. I mean, you, people ask that question, <laughs> and the movie's only been out for one week. You know, tune in, tune into my, tune into Poltergeist because I've got a lot <laughs> of box office breakdown with that. But you know, it's only one week, and globally, the movie right now is at about seventy-five million. We're still, you know, we, you know, we, we've got, uh, but well, we got San Andreas, right, which, but yeah. also this film was released Memorial Day weekend. Sure. And, Five minutes, and that's that's the yeah. biggest, one of the biggest first weekends that sure. moviegoers look towards because that kicks off the summer season. You're right. And this was I, a Memorial I'm Day gonna, weekend. I'm going to disagree with that. I think uh, that yes, traditionally, I don't feel like that people feel that way right now. Well, I think not I, I'm not sure. Well, I'm yeah. not sure that they feel that way. I, I think that. Studios keep pushing it back. We yeah. talked about this when we did Furious 7, and we talked about it when we did Captain America yeah. Winter Soldier. All these movies now that are be- being released at late April, mm-hmm. very, very beginning of May, yeah. and throughout, like, well before Mother's Day, like, there are some big pictures, like Furious 7 this past year did huge business. Huge. And when you look at when that movie was released, you know, I, right now, and, and you're right, Memorial Day for me, it was always, that's when a Star Wars movie came out. That's when the big summer blockbuster, that's when it kicked off. Mm-hmm. And then you got into June, where other big movies like an E.T., a Jaws, or things like that, you know, you would have a whole summer. But it, it seems like the business is tending to push some other event, we'll call them event pictures, before this Memorial Day weekend, where I, it makes me wonder, what if Universal decided to go with Furious 7 on Memorial Day weekend. Would Tomorrowland have maybe pulled out of release? I don't know. But they're they're, they're trying to make these gaps so that there are 12 months of movie going, Mm -hmm. which is fine. But I agree with you that I think in some case it's taking away some of that, that luster of what Memorial Day weekend box office really means. meant and means mm-hmm. because our next big one is going to be the 4th of July and leading up to that and movies on the 4th of July weekend you're going to note that they're going to start to release a week before the 4th of July or the very end of June and we'll see how that you know your Transformer movies were traditionally released on the 4th of July uh, any big Will Smith movie he was Mr. 4th of July for a long July time 4th. so box office and, and the, re- the release patterns of movies is changing um, you know we are worldwide box office 75 million we estimated about 50 51 million at this point uh, you know, it's not going to have the three-day weekend going. You know, going into this weekend, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting because I think that there's well, there's a lot still coming out that I can't wait to see. Mission Impossible, mm-hmm. Jurassic World, to name a few. You know, forty-nine percent Rotten Tomatoes. It's like you said. I think people instead of really reading reviews, they just go to sites like that Metacritic. You know, and they just get a thought. Oh, it's forty-nine percent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I do agree with you. Uh, it, it just it saddens me that people won't take the chance because it gets a 49%. John Comerford and I did a, uh, a, a podcast on Monuments Men, which got scathed, oh my by the goodness. way, by the critics. Was killed. And both of us really enjoyed another George Clooney another, movie. Yeah. And we just couldn't figure out what movie we were watching as opposed to the movie these people were watching and why there was such negativity. Now, the 49%, that's not 13% or 1%. But still, I was a little bit surprised. I thought it would have been, I, I, I thought there was a little bit of cynicism. I wish they mm-hmm. would have opened up a little more, opened up their hearts. I, I think a lot of those critics, maybe the young, the inner mm-hmm. child in them has died. So, final thoughts. Um, overall, visually, stunning. And for Disney, they really stepped up the visual aspect. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. as Disney should. I think my really my only problem with this film was the pacing. Mm-hmm. It was a long movie for especially for a Disney kids mm-hmm. film, two hours ten minutes. That's long these days. And again, we had that buddy buddy road trip scenes that I think personally lasted too long. And then for the big big exposition scenes, rushed. Mm. The big anticlimactic scene at the end where Athena dies and you drop her. Oh, done. Okay, that's okay. destroyed. Yeah. All right, um, but visually. Great, fun, paced movie. Like a a fun action movie, I guess. I think that one thing that this movie really did get me excited about was inventions. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that 
you can leave this and like hope that things do become more realities like there is the potential and i think that's fun and a good message i don't i don't know it's the funny part is like who do i recommend this movie to the most i would mm -hmm. recommend it just to people who want to see a movie and like yeah. will like the visual aspects i don't know if i could be like hi take your kids to this movie they're gonna learn a lot right. like they are but i don't know if i could go into them and say that's my that's my hook for right. you that's my hook it's more of just like it's a beautiful movie yeah and it's got they really shot for some ideals i like everyone about it i think that it's found some budding stars in Rafi and in Brit. I'm excited to see more of them. Um, I hope that George Clooney and, and Mr. Bird, like, I hope that they don't get too disheartened by all you. the critics out there because I think that they sh tried to shoot something really good and fulfilling. So I hope that they don't, you know, take things too I hope it doesn't really. I yeah. hope they don't get hurt. Well put. And in, in in these, you know, in this business, so some scathing sin things can be said. Uh, I really love this movie. I had a kind of quick con got a flashback to a quick conversation with a friend of mine who said, you know, I really like the movie. I didn't think it was. People say this a lot too. I didn't think it was great. And I said to him, you know, if every movie was great, it would cheapen the word great. And like, not every movie has to be great. It could be but fun. It could be fun. It could be enlightening. You could still have it. He goes, no. He goes, you know, you're absolutely right. He goes, but, it, and he gave me his reasons. He, he didn't feel like it had the denouement that it that it should have. Like, he, it didn't have the emotional punch. And I said, okay, you know, I get it. He goes, but I took my son. I really liked it. Me personally, I really did love this movie. Where it may not be great, it it just celebrates inventionness. It it smarts and imagination, and that I think can be lacking sometimes. I say, go see it, go see it again. Have fun. Check out all those Easter eggs. Yeah. Just have a good time. Thank you very much for joining us at Anatomy of a Movie, Marissa. Where can people find you? You can follow me on Twitter at Serafini TV. And you can find me here at Popcorn Talk. You can find me on Box Office Breakdown, most of the anatomy of the movies, and at AfterBuzz TV. And you can find me here at Popcorn Talk, Anatomy of a Movie, as well as on Twitter at DMovies1701. I have to spell this out because Steven misspelled it last time for Mad Max. It's at D-M-O-V-I-E-S, not Z. So it's <laughs> movies, like movies, 1701. Thank you for joining. We, I can't wait to see you. We can't wait to see all of your comments. Thank you for chiming in during our live chat. We look forward to more Anatomy of a Movie, more summers coming at you. Thanks, folks. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.